starting vegetables from seed. So the program tonight, uh, we're going to talk about how to select seeds. It's actually more complicated than it looks. Uh, then we're going to start them indoors. And we're also going to talk about seeding direct in the garden. And the tricky part about vegetables is to know which ones work best direct seeded, which ones work best indoors, and when to start them, and how to buy them. And that's really where we're going to start. How do we select the vegetable seeds? The way I like to grow things that are easy to grow, taste good, and give me a high yield. So if you're new to growing vegetables, I strongly recommend you don't try to grow everything under the sun. You're going to look at the list and you're going to say, wow, there's like 20, 30 different kinds of vegetables. I'm going to try growing them all. And that's a big mistake as a beginner. I strongly suggest that you pick a small number, learn to do those well, and you might as well pick things that are easy to grow, taste good, and produce something. Because not every vegetable does well in the garden. Uh, I have this program on my YouTube channel called the 10 Best Vegetables, and it's specifically picked for beginners and it's sort of a, a list that I count down from number 10 down to one and I go through and explain each one and why to I pick each one, how to select the right ones for yourself and so on, a lot of tips for each vegetable and we go through that whole series. I think if you stick to that list of 10, you'll be quite successful. Uh, there are lots of other vegetables that are more difficult to grow. Uh, so where do I usually start? Well, I would recommend with these tomatoes, Everybody grows tomatoes pretty much. And the reason is that they're the best tasting. They're not the easiest to grow. They do have some disease issues, but everybody loves eating tomatoes, especially from the garden. Lettuce and radish are good ones to choose because they're really easy to grow, especially in cooler weather. So if you're around here, which is a zone five garden, they're excellent because we can start them early. We can even grow them in the fall and we can get a pretty good harvest out of them. And then I also like peas and beans. They're pretty easy to grow. The seed's nice and large and they produce a lot of material. So it's, it's worth the space in your garden. Now there's three ways to start these vegetables. Seeds, sets, and plants. And we're going to focus mostly on seeds, but we're going to also talk about these other two. So let's start with sets. And this can be very confusing to a new vegetable grower. So we have these things called sets. And on the left there we have garlic. And that's really not a set, although it, it behaves like it. The one on the right are onions, and those are sets. So you can get onion seed, but if you're going to grow from onions from seed, you should have started about a month ago for zone five. They take a long time to grow, and to harvest this summer, you really already have the seeds germinated. If you start now, you're probably not going to get much. It's also more difficult. So if you're interested in growing onions, what I suggest is you get these sets, which are really just baby onions, and they're going to be available in stores in the next month or so. You simply pop them in the ground, barely bury them, and they'll grow. So you can skip the seed part and go right to the small onions. Uh, garlic is very similar. So when we grow garlic, we actually take the cloves and plant each one of those. And so that clove behaves just like the set and it will fill out in the summer and create a full garlic bulb. Uh, unfortunately for this year, you kind of missed the boat on these. These have to be planted in October-ish in zone five. If you can plant them a little later, but you won't get as big bulbs. And if you plant them in spring, you will grow something, but it won't be good big garlic. You buy the cloves. And in fact, the interesting story is that getting garlic seed is really difficult. These plants will make flowers, but the flowers turn into little bulbs, little sets of garlic rather than seed. And it's actually pretty tricky to make garlic seed. We use the term garlic seed, but when someone says, I'm going to go plant my garlic seed, they're actually planting these cloves, not real seed. Garlic is really easy to grow. The other option other than seeds is to go out and buy plants. Still a little early for this, but you can go out into the garden centers, April sort of time frame, and they'll have lots of things on sale there. And these will be little plantlets that you take and put in the garden. And this is actually a really good idea for new gardeners because you can sort of skip the seeding part, uh, which is a little more complicated. And you can buy these and put them in and pretty idiot proof. Get a good seedling and 
put it in the ground, it will grow. It will give you something. The problem with this approach is that you have a very limited selection of what vegetables you're going to grow. You'll see lots of tomatoes, but even the types of tomatoes you get is pretty limited compared to what you can get in seeds. You can also buy some peppers and lettuce, but the selection is limited. You generally don't find the root crops, those we want to do by seed. You also don't find unusual vegetables. So if you want to just try a few things and skip the seeding, uh, this is a good way to go. But if you want a good selection, you pretty much have to do it from seed. So which plants do we grow as plants instead of seed. Around here we typically grow tomatoes, peppers, lettuce, cucumbers, and melons as plants. So we, we start them as seeds indoors, we create plants out of them, and then we take the plant and put that in the garden. We don't do that with root crops. So carrots, radishes, beets, those we start from seed, but we put the seed right into the garden. The same is true for peas and beans. I almost never see peas and beans for sale in a nursery as plants, probably because these are vines. And if you try to grow them in small pots in a nursery, they just cling to each other and you end up with a real mess. And the second reason is they're pretty easy to do from seed directly in the garden. So it is important that you know which of these we want as plants when they go out in the garden and which are seeds. So let's go and buy some seed. Uh, you can go to most nurseries and they will sell seeds like this. You can go to Home Depot type stores. They all have some seeds. But the selection is fairly limited there. If you want a bigger selection, then what you really want to do is find some seed catalogs. There's lots of those available in North America. They have a wide range of choices and quite honestly, maybe too much of a choice because you get in there and you'll see 50 kinds of tomatoes and you won't know which one to buy. If you're going to buy from seed catalogs, now is the time to do that. In fact, I would say get your order in in the next couple of weeks and order the seeds you want. If you're going to buy these off the rack in one of these stores, there's not nearly so much of a rush. You can wait another month or two and, and buy them whenever you need them. Uh, there'll be lots of seed available in the stores, but your best selection is from catalogs. So one of the most important things about these seeds is something called days to maturity. This is very confusing. So this is a picture of a seed package. And if you look in the top right hand corner, the second row down, it says days to maturity is 68. That's kind of a confusing number. And we're going to go through and explain that because it's an important number for you to know. Now, there's lots of other information on there that's useful, too. So how many days does it take to sprout them, how big are the plants. All of that information is very useful to know when you're planting these in the garden. But for buying the seed, the most important thing here is really days to maturity. And here's why it's confusing. If this is a plant that we direct sow, so we're going to take the seed and we're going to plant it in the garden, then the days to maturity is how long does it take from the time I plant the seed to the time I eat something? How long does it take to mature? But the starting time is when I put the seed in the ground. On the other hand, if this is a, a vegetable that we traditionally set out as a transplant, so we're not seeding directly outside now, we're going to start these seeds indoor and move the plants into the garden. Now the days to maturity is the time from planting to eating. So if I take the example of a tomato, for instance, I might grow it inside four to six weeks before it goes outside. Well, that four to six weeks is not included in the days to maturity. We only start counting from the time it actually goes into the garden. I'm not sure why we do this. It makes no sense, but it is the way it's done. Now, the other thing to understand is that that day's maturity depends very much on the climate. If you live in a warm place, things, things mature faster. If it's in cold climate, they mature slower. And everybody in, let's say, North America gets the same seed pack. So the person buying the peas in Texas and the person buying it in Ontario, they get the same seed pack. They get the same days to maturity, but their climate is very different. So you have to look at this number and say it's just an approximate number. 
but it is useful, and, and this is how. It's very useful for comparing the same kind of vegetables. So here's a list of my all-time favorite three tomatoes. And if I'm comparing one tomato to another, it's a valuable date. So if we look at this, the top one here is called beefsteak. It has a day's maturity of 96 days. Now in my garden, it could be more than that. It could be less than that doesn't really matter. But what is consistent is that beefsteak always take longer to mature than early girl, and they take longer to mature than sweet 100s. The relative dates are valid. The actual number is not. Now, why is this important? If you grow in Texas, you might not care because you've got a long growing season. But if you grow in Ontario, we have a fairly short growing season and we want to get our tomatoes producing as quickly as possible because our season's so short. So once a tomato bush is producing tomatoes, we'll be able to harvest until frost. And we want those tomatoes as soon as possible. So if I'm choosing one tomato out of this list, I probably will pick the sweet 100s because they're going to be ready almost a month sooner than the beefsteak. So you might say, oh, well, why the heck would you ever pick a beefsteak? Well, beef steaks are really big, juicy tomatoes, and they're really good. I'll probably have a few of those, and I'll have a few early girls, which is a mid-sized tomato, sort of a slicing-type tomato, and the sweet 100s are cherry tomatoes. This way I get some really early ones, but I also get some later ones with completely different texture and taste. And so when I go out and buy seeds for growing in my cold climate, I always look at the maturity date and try to pick the smallest maturity date, provided it gives me the type of plant and flavor that I'm looking for. The other thing it tells you is that if it's longer than 96 days, you're probably not going to get a harvest. So there's melons and watermelons out there that other people in warmer climates can grow. And we just can't grow them because they'll never mature. We'll have a frost before they're ready. So we're somewhere around, let's, let's call it 75 days. Anything longer than that is kind of an iffy vegetable for a cold climate. Another thing that's very important is whether these are indeterminate or determinate. The way I try to remember this is that the determinate ones are determined to stay small. So on the left here, we have a typical tomato plant, which is really a vine, and it just keeps growing taller and taller all summer long. And on the right, we have a determinate plant. It, it's determined to stay small, and so it will grow to a certain size. And those are much better in containers. In a small container, we don't want a huge plant. If we're planting this out in soil, in the garden, a large vine may be better because it will produce more tomatoes. The terms are also used for pole beans and bush beans. Now, typically, bush beans will produce sooner. And I've been told for my whole life that bush beans produce a big crop early and then they stop producing. And so I always planted pole beans. They take a little longer to start producing, but then they produce till frost. And I'd much rather have my vegetables over a longer period of time because most of these I eat fresh. I don't do a lot of canning. The last couple of years I've been playing with bush beans and provided that you keep picking those beans, they will produce all season. So now I actually grow a bit of both. My bush beans give me a really early crop. My pole beans probably give me a larger crop overall, but I have to wait a little longer to get it. But if you keep harvesting those bush beans, they will produce all summer long in zone five. Now there's lots of different categories of seeds and this also can get very confusing. So we have things like heirlooms, open pollinated, hybrid, organic, and GMO. And I'd like to discuss these because it is important that you understand what they mean. Heirloom is really popular now. Everybody wants heirloom seeds and they have this mystery about them. And people think that because they're heirlooms, they're so much better than other options. And that's not necessarily true. So what is a heirloom? The interesting thing is that there is no accepted definition for a heirloom seed. Some people say that if the seed's been around for 40 years, it's heirloom. Others say 50 years. Uh, others much shorter than that. So if you take a seed and you call it a heirloom, it is a heirloom. There is no official definition. In general, it's a seed that's been handed down from generation to generation, and it's been around for a number of years, and it's consistent. We, we put it in the garden, we get the same kind of plant every year. 
And people think heirlooms are better tasting, they're better plants. That's not necessarily true. So, for instance, a friend of mine gave me some really unusual tomato seed that she got on her visit to Italy. And people over there love this tomato. And I tried growing it here and it was terrible. It didn't grow well, the, it didn't taste good. Now, there's nothing wrong with the seed, and this was certainly a heirloom because she would got it from her, her granny and they've had it in the family forever. It doesn't grow in Ontario. I mean, our climate's very different than wherever they were growing in Italy. The quality of many of these vegetables depend very much on your local climate. Just because it's heirloom does not mean it's better. It doesn't mean it's more flavorful, although it might be. An open pollinated uh, seed is one where we let nature do her thing. We plant them out in the garden and whatever comes along to pollinate them, it's open pollinated. Nobody goes out and does it on purpose. And again, some people have this notion that open pollinated is better. And again, it, it might be, but you can also get crossing between different types of plants. So if you grow two or three different kinds of melons and you put them in the garden close together and you have open pollinated, the seed out of that is usually crap because you'll get a mixture of all of these things. You won't know what you're getting. A hybrid seed is one where we actually go out and we physically have two fields with different plants in them and we go to the one field, collect the pollen and take it to the second field and by hand we pollinate each of these plants. So one thing that happens is that the seed is more expensive because it's harder to make. The other thing we get is we get hybrid vigor coming in. So hybrid seeds generally are less disease prone and they produce larger plants. Now, some people argue that they don't taste quite as good as a heirloom. One good reason to get hybrids is to get disease-free plants. Heirlooms tend to have much more disease problems. Uh, then we have organic. Organic is one of these terms that everybody equates with quality and goodness and wholesomeness. Uh, and that's not really true. That's a whole other program we could do. What organic seed is, is seed that's been grown following organic procedures. It does not mean it's without chemicals. Uh, it does not mean that the seed is good. It just means that we follow these standards. And quite honestly, the only reason I can think of for buying organic seed is because you want to support the organic movement and you want to support an organic garden. Uh, if you're buying for quality of seed, you're better off picking one of the other things. Organic is not a good reason to pick the seed. Uh, GMO is, is kind of a funny one. It's a genetically modified organism a few years ago that was in the news everywhere. And so all of the seed companies started stamping their catalogs as non-GMO seed. Well, the whole thing is just marketing. As a gardener, you cannot buy GMO seed even if you wanted to, because you typically have to buy it in larger quantities, like a farmer, and you typically have to sign a contract. So none of the seed that's available for gardeners are GMO. You don't have to worry about that. Why do we start seeds early indoors? The main reason is that our growing season is too short and we want to get an early start. I want to taste the earliest tomato that I can and starting the tomato plants indoors will allow me to do that. If I was in a climate with a very long season, I wouldn't worry so much. I'd probably grow everything outdoors. The earlier we can get the first food off our plants, the longer the harvest is. Because in a cold climate, almost all the harvest stops when it gets frozen. Now, some things survive better in frost than others, but a lot of our popular ones like tomatoes, peppers, beans, you know, the first day of frost, those plants are done. And so we have from the first picking to frost, that's our harvest. And I think the other reason a lot of gardeners do this is that they just can't wait to get in the garden and there's nothing like a tomato seedling under lights and you just smell the aroma and it's just great to start gardening early. But there's some good reasons not to do this if you don't have to. One is that it, there's extra costs. Uh, you're going to need some sort of containers. You're going to have to buy some soil. You may need some lights and so on. It's more work. And quite honestly, for most of us, in fact, probably all of us, we're going to get weaker plants. Uh, we just can't provide the light indoors to grow really good plants. Now, if you have a nice greenhouse, uh, that's a different story. 
how do you decide what to start? Well, here we go back to the maturity date of these vegetables. And things that have a longer maturity date, we start indoors because we need to get them going. Uh, we also start plants that are what we call warm growers. So these are things that germinate warm and they want to grow warm. They don't want to be out in the cold. For instance, uh, it's early spring. The ground has just got the frost out of it. We get a sunny day. It's a little warm out there, but still cool at night. I can grow some radishes and I can grow some lettuce in that temperature, but I can't grow tomatoes and peppers. They're just going to get killed. Cucumbers, melons, beans, they're all warm growers. Those things can't go outside until things get fairly warm. All of those are better candidates for starting them early inside. Uh, the other thing to consider is how many of these plants do you want? I, I grow peas, and I could start peas indoors, but I, I grow quite a few peas, and I really don't want a hundred pots of peas inside the house because I can't take care of them. I don't have the lighting for them. On the other hand, I might only grow six tomato plants, and I can accommodate those. Plants where I only want a few of, it, they work better indoors. Now, here's a little experiment I did a couple years ago. So, for years, I've been told that cucumbers you have to plant outside. And cucumbers are warm growers, so you can't plant them early. You have to wait until the ground is quite warm before you can put that seed in the ground. Otherwise, it rots. I don't know where that story came from, and most people believe it, but it's simply not true. On the right here, I've got two cucumber plants that were started indoors and were quite good size by the time they went outdoors. And then on the left is a direct seed. So I put seed in the ground when the ground was warm enough. And you can see the difference in size. The ones on the right already have fruit on them. The one on the left isn't going to do anything for at least another month. So you can transplant cucumbers, but they're a little trickier to transplant. So you just want to be very delicate with them when you put them out in the garden. There are several different ways to start seed. I'm going to look at two main ones. The one on the left here is my baggy method, and then one on the right is direct sowing in some soil. Both of these work quite well. Most gardeners will use the one on the right. I do almost everything with the baggy method, and it works really great and has a number of advantages. Now, we don't really have time to go into that in detail in this program, but there is a video called Baggy Method for Seeds on my Garden Fundamentals course, and it goes through it in detail on how to do this method. In short, you take the seed, you put it in some paper towels, you wet it, you put it in the baggy, and you let them germinate in the baggy. Now, the picture here shows seeds that were in there far too long. They're, they're too old. You want to take them out much sooner than this and then pot them up. And the advantage of this is that you can actually see the seed germinate. If you don't get anything germinating, you know it's the seed. It's not the soil that you're doing it in. I can also take every one of these and give it one pot. And so I don't have to germinate nearly so many of these seeds. If we're going to do a direct sowing, you need to start with some soil. And we don't actually use soil for this. What you want to do is get yourself a soilless mix. Now, the one I use is ProMix. And it says right on here is a seed starting mix. Uh, it does doesn't have to be a seed starting mix. As long as it's a soilless mix, it will work. Most of the bags of soil people are selling for house plants work just fine. You don't have to buy something special for seedlings. So if you have some soil for African violets or for your other house plants, all that stuff is pretty much peat based around here. All of that will work for seeds. You don't need something special. But don't use garden soil. It's now we need a container, and people use all kinds of containers here. And quite honestly, some of them are just dumb ideas. So in the middle here, we have one that uses half eggshells. Yeah, you can start a seed in there, but as soon as that germinates, you've got to move it into a larger pot because there isn't enough soil in there to develop a root system. Not only that, but unless you poke some holes in the bottom, uh, it's going to be too wet for the seedling. 
The top right hand corner are these Jiffy Pots. They're basically little discs you buy. They're full of peat moss. You put them in water and they expand and then you plant in that. These are a terrible idea. Uh, they're very popular with beginner gardeners because they're inexpensive. You'll find them everywhere you go shopping and they look like a great deal. They're easy to use. The problem is they have a plastic mesh around the outside and you have to take that off before you plant them because it doesn't decompose even though they're advertised to decompose. So if you don't take that off it, it holds the roots in. It doesn't let the plant grow well. They're just a really dumb idea. They're not big enough to start seedlings. Uh, we have these things at the bottom which are fairly popular. They're okay if you're going to start plants and keep them fairly small but if you own a decent sized tomato seedling those aren't big enough either. So they're okay to get started, but then you really should move them into a pot. And so I use just regular pots. Now here's a picture of really fancy colored ones. I just use common green ones, which I recycle over and over and over again. They don't get washed. They just get stacked in the middle of summer when I'm finished with them. They stay outside and in the spring I, I use them. You don't need anything fancy. Plastic doesn't sound like a great option, but those pots will last you 10 years. Where as most of the other stuff is throw away. You want a good size pot for these seedlings. And this is what I use. So this is a pot that's, uh, let's call it three inches across. You might as well get a decent sized one and put your plant in there. So how deep do you plant these seeds? Well, the general rule is that you plant them at a depth that's twice the thickness of the seeds. So that's pretty simple. The, the seeds are not quite that fussy, but that's a good general rule. Don't put them too deep or they won't germinate or if they do germinate they won't reach the surface so you want them just down a little bit but you do want them under the surface. Now if you're sowing really a small seed uh, you only want to cover it with a very small layer of soilless mix. I find this is extremely important and a step that most people miss. You want a fan going 24-7. If you have this fan going, you won't get diseases on your seedlings. If you don't have air movement, then there's a chance you'll get some damping off, which will kill your seedlings. But whenever I have a fan going, I, I have no problems. Now, it doesn't have to be a big fan like this for seedlings, but you want some air movement. The next thing you need is some light and you have a number of different options as a beginning a seed grower windows work fine they don't really provide a lot of light our eyes are very sensitive to light and we we think the lights in our home are pretty bright but compared to sunlight they're nothing so these poor plants they look like they're in a sunny window but in fact they're in shade heavy deep shade and they're not getting the light they need. These are tomato plants and they're actually pretty leggy. They're pretty thin, so they're not getting enough light. You can grow all these vegetables as little seedlings on a windowsill, but give it the best light you can. So ideally this is south or east facing. Germinate them right in that light and you won't have to worry about the sun. These plants can take a lot of light if they're used to the light and as close to the window as you can get. And you can grow a lot of seeds this way. You don't need anything special. But if you're a little more interested in this, then you can buy some artificial lighting. If I was going out today to buy a new set of lights, I would go to some like a Home Depot or home hardware type store and buy these new LED shop lights. They're relatively inexpensive. They give enough light to grow seedlings and they work fairly well. You have to keep the lights quite close to the plants and that's the disadvantage. And as the plants grow, you have to lift the lights up, right? We want these a couple inches away from the plants. The more bulbs you have in there, the better it is. But at least get two like this. If you have an old fluorescent fixture, that can work too. I mean, we've been doing this kind of work under fluorescent fixtures for the last 30 years and it's worked just fine. LED is less expensive as far as the hydro goes and they actually give a little more light. But there are other options. So the one on the left here is an actual LED grow light. The difference between this and the last one we looked at is that the lights in here are balanced so you're getting the right kind of light for your seedlings. 
it also gives you a much, much higher intensity light. And in fact, some of these fixtures now can give almost as much light as the sun. It's kind of hard to believe, but they can be very, very bright. Unfortunately, the really high energy ones like that uh, are pretty expensive. The other option, if you go on Amazon, you'll see all kinds of these things on the right. These little sticks with a few lights going in here. Uh, these are pretty much useless for everything. I mean, you might be able to have one low light plant under there. It's not good for seedlings that are going to go outside. These things are sold as grow lights. A lot of hobbyists buy them because they're relatively inexpensive, but they're really not much good for growing plants. So what about the temperature we use here? Uh, you can germinate all the vegetables at room temperature. Now, if you can give them a little extra warmth, that's better. So if you're growing these things in the basement and you bring them upstairs to the kitchen while they're germinating, that's a good thing. But they will germinate in the basement. Uh, the only vegetable that's a little fussier about temperature are peppers. And they will germinate cool too, but they can take a long time. So instead of seven days to germinate they might take three weeks to germinate if it's too cool so peppers do benefit from a little warmth so one way people provide this extra heat is with these heating mats you don't need a heating mat a lot of beginner gardeners think they need one of these first of all you only use it for germinating seeds once the seed germinates you want to grow them cool right so we germinate warm and grow cool so as soon as you see little green things above the soil you turn these heating mats off and what it does for you is that a tomato plant instead of taking seven days to germinate will germinate in five days okay so you're saving yourself two days but you have to go and buy this stuff the biggest problem people have with seedlings that are started indoors is what we call leggy seeds so you get these nice long growths with a little bit of green on top and this is not really a healthy seedling far too tall you want them as short as possible and the main reason you get these is not enough light it has nothing to do with fertilizer or the type of soil you've used or anything else. This is all about light. The more light you can give them, the shorter they will be and the healthier they will be. So the ones pictured here are pretty leggy already. They're, they're too tall. Doesn't mean they won't work, but these are going to be weak plants by the time they go out in the garden. Now we've got some seedlings and we have to get them outside. But remember, these seedlings have been coddled. They've been taken care of. Low light, no wind, no low temperatures. Well, think about late spring. I mean, days are warm when the sun's out. At night, it cools way down, may even go below freezing. They have none of this. The temperature is pretty much the same in our house all the time. So what we have to do is get them used to being outside. And this process is called hardening off. We need to get them used to more light, more wind, and lower temperatures. When do you do this? A lot of people want a date, and I don't like dates. I go by the weather. Let's see what it's like. As long as it's freezing at night, you can't leave these guys out there. In fact, my rule of thumb is that anything below 5 degrees centigrade will kill all these plants that you have started indoors. Okay, so nothing is exposed to below 5 degrees. And a better rule of thumb is 10 degrees. If the weatherman says it's going below 10 degrees centigrade, time to bring them inside. Now, most things will be fine down to about 6 or 7. Below that, some things will get damaged. So what you do is you wait until the temperature outside looks like it's going to be warmer. And we take them outside and we give them very little light. So they might only get an hour of direct light the first day. The next day they might get two hours. So we slowly get them conditioned to more light, more wind. And what I find works very well is you take them out and you put them on the north side of your house. They don't get a lot of light there. Right against the house it's a little warmer. They don't get quite as much wind. And then over time, you slowly move them away from the house. So a couple of days later, you move them out by two feet. And a couple of days later, you move them out another two feet. And again, this depends on the weather. If we have a week of cloudy weather, they're not exposed to full sun. So that's not the whole process. You have to have sunny days to do that. It takes about a week. After the week, they're fully adjusted to being outside. They should be taking full sun all the wind that they can get, and they should stay outside and get the low night temperature. Now they're ready to actually be planted into the garden. 
So let's look at seeding outdoors. Talked about sort of this two group of plants. Some we're going to put out as plants and others we're going to seed direct. And the ones we're going to seed direct are all the root crops, carrots, beets, radishes, lettuce you could do either way, peas and beans. They all get sown directly in the soil. It's a pretty simple process. You, you dig a little furrow like this, a little row. And by the way, the picture shows this guy making this nice row. This row is way too deep for the seeds he's planting. Okay, remember when we plant seeds, we want them covered in soil so there's twice the thickness of soil above the seed. So this trench here is way too big. Dig a little furrow, put the seed in, cover it up, water it in, and now we wait. So there's really not a lot to seeding outside. I like to put seed outside and then mulch them. I might mulch them right away depending on how big the seed is. So something like peas and beans, they're pretty big seeds. I'll put a little mulch right away. That mulch helps hold in the moisture. Once you put the seed in the ground, they can't dry out or those little seedlings will die. Things like carrot seed is very small and so it dries out really quickly. Again, I like to cover that with a bit of mulch. Right? An inch or two of straw works great. If you don't have straw, you can just use some old leaves or just water regularly. A little bit of water every day on carrot seed is not too much. You don't want to soak it really heavy, but a little bit you want so that the surface stays moist works quite well. Another important thing to consider is how far apart you're going to make these rows. And this is traditional farming. The spacing is still on seed packages. Farmers have these wide rows for a couple of reasons. One is they have lots of land, but more importantly, they have to run tractors up and down these rows. And so they need space for their tractor wheel. And gardeners used to all garden this way. I mean, we mimic what farmers do. They must know what they're doing. We learned a long time ago that we can actually move these rows much closer together because we don't have tractors. So here's a picture of a more traditional backyard garden and the arrow is pointing to a pathway. So we establish where the pathways go and that's where I'm going to walk all the time. And then on either side of this, I can have a wide bed so I can grow a pretty solid bunch of vegetables there. In this case, it's lettuce so that the leaves are actually touching each other when the plants are mature. I don't need a walkway between each row. And what this allows me to do is grow two and three times as much vegetable in the same space. Plant nice and close together. The other thing we have to consider is whether our plants are cool growers or warm growers. And here's a list of some of the more common ones. This is similar to lawn grass. So our lawn grass in cooler climates is all cool growing grass. It grows really well early on and then stops growing when it's warm. And the vegetables will do the same thing. And yet there's other vegetables that won't do anything until it gets warm. So you have to know which one this is. Cool growers can be seeded much earlier than warm growers. You might notice that most of the warm growers are actually the plants that we put out. Cool growers tend to be seeded directly early in the year. So you can come out, even when the ground still freezes, you can plant some lettuce and it will do all right. It can be covered in snow and it will still do all right. It really is a cool grower. Uh, my peas go out really early. As soon as I can dig in that soil and, and bury the pea seeds, that's when I plant my peas. The reason is they're cool growers. They will germinate cool. They like to grow cool. And once it gets warm, they stop growing. And the peas, they get old. They're no longer good eating. So you want to grow them quick early in the season. Beans, on the other hand, they're warm growers, so I can't put those in the garden for at least five weeks after I plant my peas. The soil has to warm up and it's nice and warm, and so now the beans will germinate. They need that warmth to germinate and grow, and they will produce food in the second half of the summer. The things on the left can go in earlier. Things on the right have to wait until things get warm. Now, there's something else I like to do in the garden is gambling. Okay, so we talked about how the temperature affects these plants. And if we put them out too soon, they're gonna get killed. But you know what? 
seed's pretty inexpensive. I mean, if you're a farmer and you're doing hundreds of acres, that's different. But we're only doing a $2.50 pack of seeds. So plant some of them early and take a chance. If we happen to have an early spring, you get an early crop. If we happen to have a late frost, well, you might have to replant them because all those early ones will get killed. But it's worth the gamble to get an earlier harvest. For instance, my peas, I will plant them really early, but I'll only do half of the ones I want. And most years, those will be great, and I'll get an early harvest. And then some years, they'll get killed off, and I have to replant them. Here's a little trick with peas and beans. They're both vines, so I grow them up a trellis. And on one side of that trellis, I plant peas, and I will plant those very early. And they're starting to grow in the cool weather. And by the time things warm up, they're flowering and starting to make the pods. That's the time to seed the beans, because beans will die off if you put them in cold soil. They need that warmth. By the time the beans start growing, the peas are finished because they don't do well in July and August. They're going to be done anyway. I get double use out of this trellis. Peas early in the year, beans later in the year. The other thing that's really important is thinning. Particularly when the seed is small, you're going to put too much in the ground. It doesn't look like much when you've got it in your hand and you're going to overseed these things and then come along later and just take every second, third one out. If you keep them too crowded, you just won't get good produce. On this particularly true of root crops. What they've got here is probably carrots, but it's really true of everything we grow. We have to think about how far apart these seeds are, and if the leaves start touching each other, they start shading each other, they're not going to grow right. You have to pull some of these out. In some cases, you can eat the little thinnings, and in other cases, you just pitch them on the ground and let them rot. So peas, when you buy those, they look really shriveled. And most people will soak the peas because they think they germinate faster that way. And so a few years ago, I ran a little experiment to see how true this was. And quite honestly, I've always soaked my peas. Uh, plumps them up, they seem to germinate a little faster, and that should give me a faster harvest. Does it really make a difference? On the left here, we have dry seed. That's the way it comes out of the package. In the middle here, I've taken that dry seed and put it in soil for 24 hours. So this is moist soil, and then I dug them up to take the picture. The one on the right, I just popped into water and let it soak for 24 hours in water. And that's what most people would do, is either the left side or the right side there. And you can see the difference. They've absorbed a lot of water. And seeds don't start germinating until they've absorbed that water. So in theory, the ones on the right will germinate sooner and produce bigger plants and earlier harvests. But in fact, when I tried this pot experiment, I found really no difference. So after a couple of weeks, the plants are up. They're both about the same size. Soaking really doesn't make any difference here. Uh, there's some other myths too about starting seeds. So some people start tomatoes really early. In fact, I've already started seeing people on Facebook saying, is it time to sow these things? Can I start my tomatoes? If you start them too early, you just end up growing very weak plants. So you're better off not starting them too early inside. Cucumbers, if you read the instructions for those, they'll tell you don't start them inside. You can't transplant them. We, we've talked about that already. The other thing they tell you is plant on a hill. So for years, I used to mound up this soil and make this hill and put the seeds on top. Never made any sense to me, but hey, that's what the instructions said, right? So they must know. Well, it turns out that the word hill used to mean a group. So this isn't a physical hill. You don't take the soil and mound it up. What you do is you just take two or three seeds and grow them close together. Now that doesn't make any sense either, except on a farm, plants are vines and they grow out from the center like the spokes on a wheel and they just give them lots of space. In a garden, you're better off doing these in a row and planting them about eight inches apart and letting them grow up a trellis. So anyways, that hill, that's not a real hill. 